Hey friends, Michael Kingswood. It's story time and story Saturday, but it's Sunday. Uh, and I haven't gotten this out yet. And frankly, I haven't got this out because I've been on a roll. I'm really close to finishing up Lunar Veil 6. I, instead of uh, recording this, I was writing all day yesterday. Not all day, but it was a very busy day with that stuff. But every minute I had, I was writing and I'm like a chapter or two away from being done. So that's what I'm focusing on today. Um, so rather than, uh, I, th I thought I'd have time today to, uh, get the week's story, uh, read and out to you, but I really want to get this book done finally. So rather than messing around with that, I'm just going to pull back into the archives of the channel and <laughs> show you a, a video reading that I did a number of years ago. Um, of one of my other stories, it's called the memory of justice. You will see that I look a bit different because I didn't have I didn't have hair then, and I don't remember if I had much of a beard at that point or not. And uh, the audio quality is different, <laughs> as is some of the video quality, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so I'm just gonna show that video now at the end of this, and then next week we'll get back to our regularly scheduled news stories. I uh, apologize for that, but man, I'm just cooking with gas this week, and I can't bear to uh, not finish this book. All right, enjoy this uh, older story, and I'll talk to you uh, later on uh, next weekend. Until then, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Hey, friends, it's Michael Kingswood, and it's Martin Luther King Day. Took a half day off from work, and it's time to read another story been a while since I've actually read one of these. You know, I had my buddy uh, Keith Nicholson read Nia Veritas Morte, and I had some previous recordings from the past, but hey, now I'm going to read another one. Uh, don't worry, you won't have to deal with my rather uh, amateur reading for too much longer. I've got a guy who's uh, reading my Glimmer Veil vale book. I uh, thought it was going to be done here before the holidays, but uh, obviously things happen. He had a couple technical problems, and his buddy who was helping him out with a couple things for it got close to burned out by the fires in California, so it's like, oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, I can give him a little more time to get him, uh, let him get his stuff squared away. Uh, but hopefully we'll have that getting ready here to go in the next couple weeks. Um, until then, you'll just have to deal with me. <laughs> So, <clears throat> this week, I'm going to read another short story that I wrote. This one I wrote three, four years ago, three years ago. Um, it's called The Memory of Justice. And I kind of like it. It's been a while since I've read it myself. We'll see how well I think it holds up. And then you can uh, tell me what you think if you want to. So, we'll get... Okay, The Memory of Justice by me. The world was a blur of shadows and splotches of color that swirled around as Jacob turned his head from side to side. After a while, its lack of cohesion just added to the ache in his temples, turning a dull throb into a stabbing pain that made him grit his teeth to hold back a groan. At least he had teeth. Strangely comforting bit of normalcy, that. Jacob tried to rub his brow, but found his hands were restrained. He could not move them from his sides. After a moment's concentration, he realized they were resting on thin pieces of a graining material. Wood? Pressure on his back and bottom came into focus then, and he realized he was sitting in a chair with his hands on its arms. He blinked, and the world stopped swirling so much, coming to resemble merely an, an amorphous blob. An improvement! Looking down, he could just barely make out shapes of his arms and legs and that of the chair, but he still could not move. His arms and legs must have been down to the chair. Where was he? How had he gotten here? He had no idea, no memory of anything after Clara. The name went through his mind like a jolt of electricity. Sudden fear swept through him, masking his early anxiety beneath its weight. Was she a prisoner too? Jacob tried to call out to her. But all that came from his mouth was a rough grunt. His mouth was as dry as a desert at midday, making it difficult to sound out words 
and there was an awful metallic taste lingering on his palate. He closed his mouth and worked his jaw, but saliva would not come despite the hunger pangs that he was only just beginning to recognize for what they were. How long had he been here? The world changed. Light, brighter than anything else had been, stabbed into his eyes, and he recoiled. As much as he was able to recoil, restrained as he was, he blinked several times in rapid succession, willing the new purple spots to clear from his vision so he could tell what was going on. Slowly, the glare reduced, or rather, his eyes adjusted to it, and as they did so, his surroundings became more clear. The room was not large, but it was roomy. The walls were off-white, probably the default paint job the original builders had applied. His chair was near the center of the room, which was hardwood, but covered in a cheap rug where he sat. Most of the empty bookshelves lined the wall to his left. To his right was a closed hardwood door that was painted blue. There were no windows. The wall in front of him was dominated by a large video display and its control terminal. The display was dark, but a small, lit LED at its lower right corner indicated its readiness. The light that had dazzled him came from two large directional lamps, one on either corner of the room ahead of him. Both were turned to sign directly at him. It reminded him of the interrogation room's cliché bad guys used in bad thriller movies. It even smelled like he imagined such places would clean, antiseptic, with just a hint of cleaning solution lingering in the air. The fear did not go away, it intensified. What the hell was going on here? A soft click drew his gaze to the right, to the door. Someone was coming in. The knob was beginning to turn. Jacob tried to steel himself, prepare for what was to come. It was not going to be pleasant, he knew that in his gut. Then the door opened, and his fear gave way to surprised shock as a lean woman of medium height strode into the room. She wore jeans and a loose-fitting burgundy shirt that buttoned up the front, and athletic shoes. Her hair, red-brown and pulled back into a ponytail, framed an oval face that was dominated by a slightly too large nose. His shock of seeing her here like this almost caused him to miss the fact that she carried a semi-automatic pistol in, his, in her right hand. Hello, Jacob, Thera said. We have some things to discuss. Jacob shut the tap and turned back to the bar, foaming mug in hand. Lawrence waited on his usual stool, with the same expectant expression on his face as he always did. When Jacob slid the mug across to him, he grinned. Again, the same lopsided grin as always, and waved his hand over the payment processing sensor. Jacob did not need to look to see how much of a tip Lawrence had left. That was always the same as well. Hell, if the man did not occasionally change ties, Jacob would be unable to tell whether he ever left the bar. He found it quite boring, and he often wondered if Lawrence did as well. Heard about that guy they have on trial? Jacob shrugged. He did not pay attention to that kind of news. Too depressing. Besides, Lawrence was just going to tell him about it anyway. To pass the time, Jacob fished a rag out of the sink next to the taps and began wiping down the bar. The darkly stained wood got dustier, stained from spilled drinks, or glasses without coasters, if he did not wipe it down a couple times a shift, and the owner hated when that happens. Not that there was much of a concern of spilled drinks tonight. It was Tuesday, and the place was empty except for Lawrence. Legal expert on the news thinks the jury is going to decide guilty. Lawrence swallowed a gulp of his beer and burped softly before continuing. Says the DA is pushing for a total memory wipe. That right. Lawrence nodded his head resembling a bobblehead doll for a moment. This was his last drink for the night. He would bitch about it, but the last thing Jacob needed to do was clean up more barf. Not sure what I think of that. Lawrence looked down at his mug for a long moment. Almost be more humane just to shoot him, you know? <laughs> right. Got him down like a rabid dog. Real humane. Lawrence, I think you've had the door swung open drawing his gaze away from a stain that had somehow escaped his earlier wiping. When he saw the woman entering, he lost track of what he was about to say. She glanced over at Lawrence, but quickly, quickly dismissed him instead of focusing on Jacob. Her eyes, green, he thought, flickered up or down, taking him in, or as much as him as, as was visible, above the bar anyway, and her lips turned upward into a small smile that made her face light up. Still serving dinner? 
Kitchen just closed, Jacob said. His, her smile faded as quickly as it appeared. He added, well, I think I can rustle something up. She sidled up to the bar at the far end from Lawrence. Thanks, I'm starving, and I need a beer. That's what I'm here for. I'm Jacob. The woman took his hand in a gentle but strong grip and smiled more broadly. Clara. Clara Cumberland. Clara, what? She made a soft tisking sound. Moving with the languid grace he had admired from the first time he met her, six weeks before when she first walked into the bar, he stepped in front of his chair and leaned forward until her face was at eye level with him. Those deep green eyes, which had always before had flashed with humor and warmth, were gone. They were now cold and sharp. Shh, pigeon, she said, and he felt something cold and hard touch his left cheek. Things will become... The hard metal of the pistol's front sight traced a line down his cheek and across his chin as she spoke. Very clear, soon enough. She smiled then, a mirthless grin that only enhanced the ice in her gaze and stepped back from him. He imagined he could still feel the touch of the gun against his skin as she crossed her arms and turned away toward the display control station. What was she playing at? You do not remember when we first met. She spoke without turning around, instead tapping the control station to bring it to life. Sure I do. You just finished unpacking and came in for dinner and a beer because you didn't feel like... No! Clara rounded on him, her eyes flashing angrily for a second, before she schooled her face to calm ice once again. She took a deep breath and then spoke slowly, more calmly. We did not meet six weeks ago, Pigeon. You don't remember our first meeting, but I will never forget. She lowered her gaze and took another deep breath, and it was obvious Clara was forcing down some deep emotions. What was she talking about? Jake had never seen her before that night in the bar, and he was sure of it. He opened his mouth to retort, but found the words frozen in his mouth as Clara looked back up, her frosty eyes meeting his in a gaze that he could not look away from, and spoke again. Five years ago today... You raped and murdered my sister. Stunned, Jacob just stared at Clara for what seemed an hour, but in fact it was probably more like 30 seconds. He had done what? How could she think him capable of such a thing? In his entire life he had never laid hands on a woman, even those who really needed to be slapped or otherwise stopped from hurting themselves or others, <laughs> namely him. When he was little, three, maybe four, Jacob got into a fight with his sister, God rest her soul, and kicked her. His father had taken his belt to Jacob's bottom and then explained the reality of life in no uncertain terms. A boy, a man, does not strike or in any way harm a girl, ever, for any reason, no matter what. Clara, you have me confused with someone. I've never, instead of replying, Clara tapped the remote control. He had not noticed that she picked it up, and the wall display lit up. A news broadcast began to play. He was five years old from the time stamp in the lower left corner of the screen. He showed a body being rolled into an ambulance. The entire scene was blocked off by yellow crime scene tape, and uniformed police policemen stood watch all around. The title at the bottom of the screen next to the network identification read, Brutal Murder in Palm Springs. The victim is not yet unidentified, said the off-screen anchor in a deep, professionally neutral baritone, was found naked and beaten by a local man who called the authorities immediately. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Police suspect she was sexually assaulted and are beginning a canvas of the surrounding neighborhoods. A brief flash of the victim's face appeared before the paramedics closed the ambulance doors. Young. Pretty. Though it was hard to be sure from all the bruising on her face from where her assailant had beaten her. Jacob felt the surge of revulsion, followed by righteous indignation. What kind of sort of a man would do that to a woman? And how could Clara think he was to blame? Jacob turned his gaze back to Clara and found her watching him with a knowing smirk. Repulsed? Shocked that something so horrible could happen that I blame you? He nodded. She tapped the remote again and the display shifted. Another news stream, this one dated three weeks after the first. The reporter, an olive-skinned woman with wavy black hair who wore a navy blue pants suit, stood in front of an office official-looking building that was fronted by wide stairs and fluted columns. She spoke into a small microphone with practiced neutrality, though her eyes flashed with satisfaction as she spoke. 
Breaking news about the serial killer that has been plaguing Palm Springs. Police today arrested a suspect in connection with the case. His identity has not been released, but officials say there is ample evidence to show that he stalked, raped, and then killed seven victims. Seven? Jacob shook his head and opened his mouth to speak, but the display shifted again and he lost his breath and his stream of thought in a heartbeat. The video was from three days later. Donald Weatherby, the suspect in the Palm Springs killings, was denied bail today. The judge cited the extreme nature of the crimes and Weatherby's dismissive attitude in his decision. Weatherby was upbeat after the hearing. What do I care? I'll be out long before long anyway, said another voice, one that sent shivers down Jacob's spine. He wanted to look away, but he could not. He knew that voice. He had known it his entire life. He could have drawn the face on the smiling, joking man in correction facility orange from memory. The face was his own. <laughs> what? Jacob shook, with head, shook his head. How? He did not do that. He could not have, and yet, and yet, there he was, plain as day. It's a trick. You, he swallowed. You doctored the video. Clara shook her head slowly, her lips twisting into a little sneer of sadistic enjoyment, but she said nothing. Well, that's not me! His shout evoked the only another tap of her finger against the remote control. The same female reporter from the earlier clip appeared on the display. This time, she wore a loose-fitting blue dress that was elegant in its simplicity. In counterpoint to the neutral professionalism that Jacob had always heard reporters claim they had, she wore a broad smile and her eyes sparkled with triumph. The jury has just announced its verdict in the Donald Weatherby trial, and it is unanimous. Guilty on all counts. Sentencing is in two weeks. The district attorney has announced he will push for a total memory wipe. The defense declined to comment. The clip ended, and Jacob understood. Oh, God, it was true. He did not remember doing or saying any of these things because it's almost more humane to just shoot him, you know? Lawrence's words, spoken all those weeks ago on the night Jacob and Clara first met, this time, anyway, rang in Jacob's ears. Or was it Donald? He still thought of himself as Jacob, but that was a lie, wasn't it? All his memories. What was real and what was a lie? How long had he really been here living his life? Five years? No, the final clip had been from a year after his arrest, then four? Or two? How long does it take to erase a man and create a new one within his own head? He shook his head, part of himself trying to deny what was happening, but he could not. Oh, Lord, he was a monster. And Lawrence was right. It would have been better if they'd just put him down all those years ago. He was crying. He did not notice before now, but his cheeks were wet with tears. His chest heaved and he, wore so he felt sobs racking his chest. But it was almost as though it was another man doing it, not him. And it really was another man, wasn't it? Clara touched the remote again, and a stream of pictures began flowing across the display. A young woman, pretty, smiling, her auburn hair parted above her brows and hanging past her shoulders. Her hair done up in a bun, cut short, wearing a flowery summing dress, a graduation gown and cap, a bridesmaid's dress. Jacob didn't have to ask. That was Clara's sister. What was her name? You should know it. A final picture. A young woman, her face bruised, her nose broken, several teeth missing, her eyes open in an unfocused stare of death. Jacob gagged and looked away, trying to keep his stomach contents down. Clara bounded across the room and grabbed him by the hair. Look at her! she growled, forcing his head around to look at the display again. Tears streamed down his cheeks, and he sobbed. <laughs> what? Jacob swallowed and forced the sobs down. He opened his mouth, but all that came out was a whisper. I'm sorry. Clara released him. More like flung him away and stepped back two paces. Her breathing was slow, steady, but her nostrils flared like a raging beast and there was a dreadful heat in her gaze. You're sorry. Her voice was flat, almost dead. She paused for a short moment then shook her head. Not good enough. In the silence that followed, Jacob could clearly see, despite the ruined state of her face on the display, the family resemblance between Clara and her sister is an eerie juxtaposition. Clara's life and vibrance next to her sister's silence and stillness. 
Jacob found he could not look away from the pair of them. What do you want from me? He knew the answer, but he needed to hear her say it. They decided to wipe your memory, put in another, send you to the other side of the world where no one would know you, and leave you here. Her sneer became a snarl. My sister is dead, and you go on living as though nothing ever happened, and they call that justice. She drew in a deep breath and raised her right hand. Jacob had not even noticed she was still carrying the pistol. What do I want? Clara said. I want justice. He should have been afraid. He should have cried out against the injustice of it all, but that would have been a lie. All he felt was resignation and somehow, perversely, relief. Lawrence was white, after all. All the same, he had to try. You know they'll catch you. <laughs> Do the same as me. You won't remember her, me, or even yourself. He made a little gesture with his bound hands, taking in the room. You won't even remember this, so what's the point? Clara stared at him for several seconds, then glanced off to her right. He turned his head and saw, over in the corner, beside the directional lamp, a small camera. A red, blinking light near its lens indicated that it was recording. I'll remember, she said. Then there was a flash, followed by the blackest. So yeah, uh, it's been, uh, like I said, a few years since I wrote this. Probably uh, about that long since I read it. And uh, yeah, I did a little scene break in the middle of the story, uh, transiting back in time six weeks to when they first meet. And obviously it's, it's a little easier to tell that that's happening in the written form because I put a little spring, sp scene break indication on the text of the page. Uh, but hopefully they didn't throw you too much. Um, yeah. Uh, I still like this one. Uh, you know, I, I'm personally a big believer that, you know, some folks just need killing. And, you know, so capital punishment I'm good with. Um, so, But this is an alternative that I don't know if I've ever... I don't know, remember where I got the idea for from it, but it struck me as it could be an alternative that somebody uh, might say, yeah, you know, uh, I've, I've seen stories with, you know, cryo-freezing criminals for 20, 30 years, or 40 years, or whatever, and you know, all, all kinds of different things, but hey, wipe their memory. Then that's sort of like killing the person who did it, right? Because a new person, you wipe the memory, you put a whole new personality in a person, assuming that's actually really technically feasible, which I have my doubts about that also, but let's just go with it, right? Um, and hey, isn't that just as good? And then you're actually killing, it's not a killing somebody. Oh, you get the moral thing. Oh, yay, we've, we're moral. Look how moral we are. We punish without killing. Well, yay, good. But <laughs> yeah, tell that to the families, right? And that's where that came from. Um, so hopefully you liked it. If you didn't, well, sorry. If you did, go sing my praises to everyone. And, or, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, go purchase a story just because you want to to give some, give a guy a tip. Or, you know, go to my, uh, send me some Ethereum or Litecoin. I'd say Bitcoin, because but, you know, holy cow, the transaction prices and that are uh, super huge these days. But, hey, send it to me anyway, and my wallets are going to be in the uh, uh, episode descriptions. Or, you know, go to Patreon, support me. Or, hey, just buy a bunch of books. That's the easiest way to go.